Hey guys, Solemn Salmon here, and with the Cherry update for Stellaris and the accompanying Apocalypse expansion on the horizon, I wanted to take a look at all the reasons everyone should be getting hyped for it. The free 2.0 update for Stellaris re-energizes the game, pushing it towards new frontiers as a whole host of new and upgraded mechanics come crashing in. I've got seven major topics to touch on in this video, so let's get started. Border Rework So in the current version of Stellaris, an empire's borders grow around its colonized worlds and frontier outposts volumetrically, spilling outward into the depths of space as the empire becomes denser and more developed. You can increase your borders through technology, empire traits and ethics, but largely it relies more on maths and arbitrary numbers than any predictable science. And that's sort of the problem, the unpredictability. Stellaris has never been completely clear on how each colony or outpost will affect your borders beyond the simple fact that it will. You can throw down a frontier outpost only to find that some of the systems you wanted are just out of range, or worse, remove an outpost and find your empire suddenly carved in two. With hyperspace galaxies, the arbitrary nature of border growth is only exacerbated. You can suddenly find yourself the owner of a system that, whilst geographically close to you, is virtually impossible to actually reach via lane travel. It's nice to know that I own a black hole, it's just a shame that I'll never get to see it with my one eye. In Stellaris 2.0, borders have become a reflection of direct system ownership, rather than volume originating from a single point. To clarify, each individual system in the galaxy will now have a single owner, based on who controls the system's starbase, with an empire's borders a reflection of all its own systems. Frontier outposts are gone from the game, and claiming new systems is a process of building or annexing a starbase in the system with colonies only able to be founded in owned systems. In essence, borders are becoming much more exact and simplistic at the cost of some additional micromanagement. The process of building starbases to gain systems should result in a more gradual and less random growth of empires in the early game, as empires slowly claim the exact systems that they want around them, rather than suddenly colonizing three disparate planets and owning a quarter of the galaxy. Starbases. I mentioned starbases a couple of times there, and some viewers may be asking themselves, what in the name of the Great Worm is a starbase in Stellaris? Well, in the current build, you can construct a spaceport around a colonized planet for 300 minerals, allowing you to build and repair ships, upgrade for increased bonuses to armor, firepower and naval capacity, and all that kind of thing. The Cherry update throws a lot of that out of the window, introducing souped up and spectacular starbases. As mentioned, a starbase's primary function is to determine system ownership, i.e. whoever controls the starbase controls the system. But higher levels of starbases can also take on multiple functions. Starbases come in five different levels. Outpost, Starport, Starhold, Star Fortress, and Citadel. And at the start of the game, you'll have access to the first two, unlocking the rest through technology. The higher level the starbase, the more buildings and modules you'll be able to slap on it, but each empire will have a starbase capacity, limiting how many higher level starbases you can have. Let's break that down a little. The lowest level of starbase, the outpost, is extremely basic. It can't build any modules or buildings, but it doesn't require any maintenance and doesn't count towards your starbase cap. Essentially, outposts exist solely to claim ownership over a system. Any starbases upgraded to starport or higher, those of increasing complexity and power, will count towards that cap, however. What makes starbases special, though, are the modules and buildings you can construct on them. Modules are the fundamental aspects of a starbase that determine its role. Build shipyards, and you can construct a mighty naval starbase capable of churning out multiple starships of the line at the same time. Anchorages allow you to construct ports for your fleets with additional naval capacity, whilst trading hubs will boost the economy of your system. Buildings are the internal additions to starbases, which either improve the function of your modules or apply buffs to the starbase as a whole. Alongside replacing frontier outposts, starbases also replace defense stations as the primary defense within a system. To complement their own defensive capabilities, you can augment starbases with defense platforms, which are automatically updated with new technologies as you research them to maximize firepower. Even in warfare, your starbases cannot be destroyed though. However, they can be disabled and captured by enemy forces. Speaking of which... Warfare. 
The addition of starbases and changes to warfare mean that wars can now be fought for specific systems, rather than just planets. In Cherry, you can use influence to claim systems, using those claims as a casus belli and war goal. Occupying enemy systems will now be a task of disabling and capturing its starbase, which must be done before you can invade any of the colonies within the system. Alongside this, 2.0 introduces status quo peace offers, where the outcome is not one-sided and both sides can take away systems that they have claimed and or occupied. With war goals allowing wars to take place over varying scale, from border skirmishes to total conquest, the war score system has also been updated. In other words, it's been completely replaced with a new system, War Exhaustion. Measuring from naught to 100%, War Exhaustion measures a side's weariness and attrition, representing how willing they are, logistically and psychologically, to continue fighting. Once a side hits 100% War Exhaustion, they can be forced into a status quo peace. FTL Rework So currently, there are three basic forms of FTL travel. Warp, Hyperlane, and Wormhole. And it is here that we reach easily the most controversial and contentious part of the Cherry update, because in 2.0, there is just one. Hyperlane. Other forms of FTL can be unlocked in the late game, much as Jump Drive can currently, but the fundamental point here is that Warp and Wormhole travel as we know them are gone. Obviously, not everyone is or will be happy with these changes, but Wiz tried to lay out the reasoning the Slurus team had behind the decision to go with Hyperlane only in Dev Diary 92, using static defenses as a test case. Essentially, consolidating FTL types presents the opportunity to use natural choke points and strategic systems to deepen the tactical aspects of the game, without overcomplicating the gameplay experience, and allows empires to actually lock down their borders and build defenses. In a Hyperlane only galaxy, an FTL inhibiting starbase would only need to stop enemy fleets from leaving the system again. After an enemy fleet enters the system, they can use emergency FTL to retreat, or they can attack. Add in warp FTL, and an FTL inhibiting starbase now has to project a bubble encompassing multiple systems, otherwise the enemy fleet could simply bypass the area. Thus, the bubble must pull warp capable enemy fleets into the system and force them to battle or retreat. However, it cannot affect hyperlane capable enemy fleets in the same way, otherwise it could pull them from multiple systems away from their jump location. In terms of defenses, you'd also have to ensure that hyperlane choke points had FTL inhibiting star pieces in them to defend against hyperlane capable fleets, and make sure your entire border was covered in interdictor bubbles. Add in wormholes, and suddenly the interdictor bubble doesn't make intuitive sense, because wormhole FTL is point to point so theoretically, it should bypass any bubble without being affected. Thus, you'd have to create a third kind of FTL inhibitor method to cover that. Never mind displaying all that on a galaxy map in a way that makes realistic sense, simply writing this down and reading it has been a mission. In essence, a real-time strategy game of the complexity and scope of Stellaris is simply too complicated for such an asymmetrical FTL system, and further improvement and development of the game is in fact improved by stripping some of it away. Hyperlane is therefore the most rational system to maintain in the game, because it allows for a more strategic view of warfare and fleet mechanics, it allows for the implementation of certain game elements that Warp and Wormhole FTL would make irrelevant, and it simplifies the game for both players and developers. Hyperlane isn't going into Cherry unaltered though. Generation of hyperlanes in the galaxy will be altered to create more islands and choke points, with in-game options to alter the frequency and connectivity of the lanes. Sublight travel also sees a significant change, as ships will now have to move through a system in order to reach lane entry points. No more jumping into a system, remaining motionless for a couple of seconds and then jumping onward. This change seems pretty good for immersion, alongside providing more tactical options as fleets can now guard important lanes. Sublight speed will be increased though to balance the change. Jump drive remains in the game, albeit slightly altered. It functions largely as a super efficient hyperdrive, but with the additional ability to grant occasional point to point jumps, similar to how warp currently works, with a recharge time before it can be used again. For any wormhole fans out there, I do have some good news. Whilst they're gone as an FTL type, wormholes themselves are still in the game, albeit in a new form. They can now be found as natural features within some galaxies, allowing for travel between two different systems, potentially across the galaxy. Technology is required to stabilize them, 
after which ships can be sent through to discover rich planets, or perhaps weird shape-shifting aliens. A more advanced form of the new wormhole system are the gateways. Somewhat akin to stargates, gateways are a galaxy-spanning network that allows near-instant travel across the galaxy. Unlike wormholes though, gateways allow travel to more than one destination, and require a late-game technology to reactivate and control. Galactic Terrain Switching to a hyperlane-only FTL system and the creation of strategic choke points allows for the implementation of systems with unique terrain and effects that warp or wormhole travel would have bypassed and made pointless. Currently announced terrain forms include nebulas, which block all external sensor coverage and allow for hidden bases and ambushes, pulsars, which interfere with deflectors and shields, rendering them useless, neutron stars, which interfere with navigation and decrease sublight speed, and black holes, which interfere with FTL travel, increasing the time it takes to buffer or make an emergency jump. Environmental effects and hazards should add another strategic and tactical layer to the game, complementing Hyperlane nicely. Fleet and Ship Design With changes to the galaxy and warfare designed to improve the tactical and strategic elements of Stellaris, it's only natural that fleets and ships receive changes beyond just FTL type. The Cherry update introduces a number of changes designed to redress combat balance and doom stacking, one of which is the Force Disparity Bonus. Intended to combat the disproportionate casualties a smaller fleet incurs when attacked by a larger fleet, this bonus will increase the firing rate of the smaller fleet, proportional to how much smaller it is than the larger fleet. Thus, a fleet half the size of its attacker would gain a bonus of 50% to firing speed. The larger fleet will still be more powerful and thus should win the engagement, unless the smaller fleet is significantly more technologically advanced, but will incur more casualties than without the bonus. Coupled with the problem of disproportionate casualties is the fact that fleets in the current build will fight to the death unless ordered to make a unified retreat from combat. This often means that wars are decided in the first major battle, and to redress this problem, 2.0 introduces the concept of ship disengagement, allowing individual ships to disengage from combat, returning to the fleet when the battle has been concluded. The likelihood of a ship disengaging from combat is influenced by its remaining hull points in its class, i.e. smaller, more heavily damaged ships will be more likely to try to disengage. Another new feature, War Doctrines, also influences disengagement chance. War Doctrines are a new empire-wide policy that dictates the overall strategic doctrine of your fleets. For example, the new Defense in Depth Doctrine reduces disengagement chance, but increases fire rate whilst inside friendly territory, ideal for defensive wars whilst the hit-and-run doctrine increases the chance of ship disengagement, perfect for skirmishing. The Cherry update also addresses the fact that empires currently generally only ever need a single admiral for their entire fleet, regardless of whether the fleet contains a single ship or hundreds of different designs. The solution is the introduction of command limits, a limit on how large any individual fleet within your empire can be, thus how many ships an admiral in charge of said fleet can provide bonuses to. Command limit is driven by technology level and traditions, and Admiral skill has no effect on it. The limit does not influence how many ships can engage in a single battle though. For example, if an Empire has a command limit of 30, and three ships of 30 corvettes each, all three fleets could engage a single enemy ship simultaneously, but as individual fleets within the larger engagement. As this means players will have more fleets to keep track of, Cherry introduces a fleet manager interface, which grants an overview of an Empire's navies. From the fleet manager, you can also design fleet templates, allowing you to create fleets to a specific composition of classes and quickly replacing any losses to maintain that composition. Fleets will also have a home base, the primary star base to which they will return to when ordered, and home bases will receive a slightly higher priority for building new ships to reinforce a fleet weakened through combat. In terms of the design of the ships themselves, the most significant change is the function of power reactors. Previously, power reactors were components, much like armor and shields, requiring a fiddly trial and error balance to ensure you could actually power your ship whilst making it as powerful as possible. Now, each ship is outfitted with a single reactor, taking up a unique ship slot in much the same way as its hyperdrive or sublight engine. Reactor power can be increased through technology, and larger classes of ships will have more powerful reactors than smaller classes. Power can also be augmented with reactor boosters, a new component that uses an auxiliary ship slot. Replacing the current armor translates to damage reduction format that inordinately aids larger ships over smaller is a system more akin to how shields currently work. 
Each armor point is effectively an extra hit point for the ship, but requires a starbase to prepare once it is depleted. Missiles also receive changes and work more like torpedoes in the current build, and all missiles will now bypass shields completely, making armor a more reliable defense. Hull points now correspond to how effectively a ship will function, with debuffs applied to speed and combat ability as it receives more damage. As missiles only affect hull points in the new armor mechanics, they are a weapon specifically designed to soften up enemy ships, make them less effective in combat. Related to missiles is the fact that there is no longer a specific starting weaponry technology for empires. Rather, all empires will now start with basic lasers, mass drivers, missiles, deflectors, and armor unlocked. 2.0 also sees the reintroduction of selecting specific combat computers for your ship designs, rather than having set computers per class of ship. Each type of computer comes with a specific tactic for your ships, ranging from swarm, where ships charge enemy vessels and engage them in close, to artillery, where ships will bombard them from range. The combat computers are not universal, and each class of ship can only choose certain ones, e.g. corvettes can be swarm, but not artillery. Ground combat. Combat changes are not limited to the cold vastness of space though, and any ground units on cold arctic worlds will also see a significant rework, aiming to redress a number of significant issues with their function. Rather than a vital element of war, ground armies are predominantly used only to reduce unrest on planets and occasionally fight off an unprepared attacker. The main issue with their use is the fact that the number of defensive armies on a planet is capped, whilst the number of invading armies is not allowing attackers to build a doom stack of 40-ish armies and win 99 out of 100 invasions. The first element of the rework sees defensive armies removed as an independent buildable option, and are now only created and fielded with the construction of certain buildings. Capital buildings field a token force, whilst military academies and the new fortress building generate a greater amount. Fortresses will produce a modicum of unity, but more importantly, will shield their defensive armies from orbital bombardment, making them more effective in combating invaders. The armies they produce will also be dictated by the pop working them, so a very strong pop would produce powerful armies, whilst a droid would generate robotic defense armies. Defensive armies will also no longer reduce unrest, although fortresses will. The rework for assault armies sees them become a predominantly space-borne element, automatically embarking when created and remaining in orbit rather than garrisoned planetside. The introduction of combat wit is designed to reduce the effectiveness of an invading doom stack, and retreating armies engaged in any combat will also no longer be able to get out of there risk-free, with the chance that retreating armies will be destroyed in the process, much like a fleet making an emergency FTL jump. Attachments have also been completely cut from the game, removing an increasingly unnecessary element of micromanagement from army creation. Hopefully this video will have gotten you pumped for Cherry Update and Stellaris 2.0. Let me know in the comments which feature you're looking forward to and your thoughts on those announced so far. Like and subscribe for more great videos from me, Solemn Summon. Until next time.